Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm Carmen Olaichea. I am in Argentina and I'm here with three hats. I, I belong to three organizations. The first one is Fundación Cambio Democrático, is an organization that is focused on conflict transformation. The second one is Crear Vale la Pena, is an organization that is focused on art and social transformation. And the third one is Impact, and uh, it's focused on art, culture, and conflict transformation. And uh, now I will pass uh, the time to present herself to Cynthia, uh, to Marianne. Hunter. Uh, thanks, Cindy. Um, hi, hello, everyone. Um, my name's Marianne, and I have uh, I work with Carmen and Cynthia on the Impact Project, which Cynthia, which we'll pass over to Cindy to talk about in a moment, and to begin a bit of a chat today. Um, I'd like to firstly acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land on which I work um, and live and that's the Mornina people here in southern Tasmania and I'd like to just convey my respect to all um, elders of Indigenous communities uh, who we may work with, um, elders past, present and also the future elders that many of us work with um, for those of you who work in education contexts and in schooling context uh, it is indeed a, a privilege and a responsibility to be working with um, elders and ancient knowledges in those spaces. Um, so thank you very much and thanks Madeline. This is a very um, wonderful opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the work that um, Carmen, Cindy and I have been engaged with, with a wider collective of, um, of arts practitioners, uh, educators, conflict uh, workers uh, in this space. And I'll pass over to Cindy to, um, to begin. And we're hoping for some uh, in, lots of interaction and discussion with you all. So um, Cindy will talk a little bit about the structure for today. Okay, um, let me see. So uh, first I'd like to thank uh, Madeline and ITAC for inviting Carmen and Marianne and me to create a short presentation and conversation. It gave us a chance to think together at a conceptual level um, that we often don't often that have, have that much of a chance to do. So it's really been a pleasure to prepare for this. Um, I work as the director of the program in Peace Building and the Arts at Brandeis University, uh, where I'm based in an international center for ethics, justice, and public life, not in an academic department. And in the center, we kind of face out to the world of practitioners and professionals and art activists and artists. Um, and before coming to Brandeis, I, I did a lot of work in a community-based oral history center that was grew out of an arts council. So I've been working at this um, arts, culture, social change, uh, and conflict transformation for a few decades now. Um, and um, I, I guess to, I would like to just introduce you briefly to IMPACT, this um, emerging structure and set of processes that uh, and the acronym stands for the Imagining Together Platform for Arts, Culture, and Conflict Transformation. Um, and uh, IMPACT has, the idea for it has been growing for a decade or so, um, when a number of us working in this area and documenting practice realized that there is somewhat of a field. There's, um, it's not necessarily always bounded in the same way or named in the same way, but there are a lot of people working at the nexus of justice, peace, culture, and the arts, and that that field could really be nourished by field building, by there being some sort of infrastructure to support people working in that area. And that would include people who are working as teaching artists, um, certainly plenty of conflict resolution work and justice building to do within schools, but also in communities in zones of violent conflict or in fact in anywhere in the world. So this Imagining Together platform for arts, culture and conflict transformation is an emerging organism. We don't know exactly what shape it's going to take, but um, it's now a kind of a web of teams working on different, um, different ways of strengthening the field, including 
virtual learning exchanges that Carmen and Marianne are, are uh, spearheading. Some of us are working for advocating for the field with philanthropists. Others are working on ethical principles. Others are working on people who want to start regional organizations in their regions. Um, what binds us together is a set of shared values, including reciprocity, respect, mutuality, creativity, uh, decolonizing approaches to working together, and a deep respect for different um, epistemologies, as Marianne began to lead us to, to indigenous systems and ways of knowing, to the knowing that emerges from the arts, the knowing that emerges from our different disciplines, and also a recognition of the complexity of ourselves and our communities and the challenges we're facing in the 21st century. We, um, we believe that culture and the arts have crucial roles to play and that this field will be stronger when we're connected, learning from each other, um, having sustained conversations about questions of ethics and efficacy. And um, if you want to know more about impact, I think it would work if you just Google Imagine Impact in Brandeis and you could um, find some stuff there. Report. So that's a, a broad brush picture of impact and uh, now I'll turn it back to you, Carmen. Thank you, Cindy. So um, let me tell you how this is going to be. We have divided the time in four blocks. First, we will briefly present some core concepts behind our work, and then we will have time for questions and comments. And after that, we will have another round with cases connected with our presentations, and then a last chance for questions and comments. And then I will start with my presentation. In my library, I have a book that was published in 1969 and it was written by 14 North American specialists. The name is towards the year 2018, last year. Oh. And they were trying to predict life on Earth 15 years from then. There are very few things in the book that became reality. They failed dramatically. For instance, there is a chapter called Climate. And it starts with the following sentence. Man will control the rain, the fog, the storms, and probably the weather. Mm. They were important especially, but mostly they were a manifestation on the mainstream thinking of the time. So they were 100% confident on the power of science, 100% blind for the inability of humans to understand the complexity of the planet systemic functioning. And they were full of the sad arrogance that made us believe we were the most important species on earth. And now I would like to invite you to listen to the following words and feel the resonance these words have today. Ecosystem, systemic, complex, multidimensional, interdependent, circular, global, Gaia. These entangled notions and perspectives are both specific approaches that we need to understand and care, and are also a guest belt that can inspire us in all our collective endeavors because this vocabulary expressed the emerging common sense of our time, as Thomas Kuhn put it, and they are part of the new narrative we are creating to guide our decisions. <clears throat> In 50 years, we have moved away from that mainstream thinking, and we have started a collective and all-inclusive process of transformation that is still going on. I have no doubt that by now we are all aware that something is going on in our bodies, our minds, our hearts, and our souls. We can even look back now and see some milestones of such an extraordinary collective transformation. One that is not like others because we now need to transform as fast as we can 
in order to be able to stop the inertia of destruction we are performing all over. We really need to do it before it's too late for huge proportions of life. But it's different also because never before we had so many technological and institutional tools to think and develop new strategies for remediating some of the damages and for creating new and more sustainable ways to be on Earth. And this extraordinary, overwhelming, but also exciting time that we are living together is so vital for us that every day we are aware of it. We move along opposite feelings, fear and hope, vulnerability and sense of power, shame towards other forms of life, and pride for the exceptional abilities we have. Sometimes we will not be able to change on time, and others we feel that of course we will. This is a time then for personal and collective commitment transformation. But how to commit and towards which horizon? This is a question I cannot answer. Definitely not today. But I can share my vision on how we are going towards this horizon. First, we have to reckon that most of the time, these needs, feelings, and new understandings that we have are entering in our consciousness in the form of a conflict. The presence of conflicts is not only normal, but unavoidable in times of transformation. This is the way societies put light to those beliefs and actions that they are starting to question and reject. So, from an optimistic perspective, we could say that the incredibly amount of conflicting situations we are living could also be taken as a source of hope that understanding that at least some of us are. Also, we can see it as a sign of our resilience and as a map of what we need to address urgently. And I have an optimistic perspective, in part because this is my nature, but also because I spent a lot of my time searching for the signs that show that we are truly, truly going through this collective transformation. And I believe that although it won't be without pain, we are being successful. In the last 30 years, I have gone through moments of crazy hope and of hopelessness. But most of all, I have learned to value the immense amount of effort and creativity that we can produce when we are in times of collective search. Millions of us are doing our part. These parts sometimes are just little tiny pieces and very focused. And other times they are transversal and huge. And all together, they draw the map of the 21 century quest in which we are all embarked together. The conversation that we have today is organized by ITAC, and I would like to share their vision. A world where every country has artists working in the heart of communities and learning, where these artists are continually improving internationally connected and well supported and the potential of the practice and its transformative power is visible and valued <clears throat> and i wanted to read it because i believe that for this quest there are many tools but probably one of the most powerful is art art in all its dimensions because it's one of our more complex and complete source of creation and communication. Art as a language, as a technical discipline, as a space of encounter with oneself and with the other, as a manifestation of the zeitgeist, as a way to access the collective unconscious, as a way for the construction of a new 
metaphors, and narratives. In impact, we work to raise awareness on how art and culture are one incredibly way to intentionally create conditions where our collective search and creativity can flourish and expand and can really help us to transform our actual conflicts. Thank you very much and I pass it to Marianne now. Um, thanks so much, Carmen. And I just want to bring up, uh, I just want to, I guess, uh, build on what Carmen has said there in a, in a kind of global sense and a wider conceptual sense and bring it to the heart of the artist. So when we think about artistry and um, I engage with one foot in um, the practices of artists who work in communities and also educational contexts and also one foot in education where I work with pre-service educators who are working with the arts in both formal and informal settings. So I'm very interested in the way in which, and, and I guess practice in the ways in which um, artists engage in context of change. And that the artist's role, the artist's heart, is a heart of transformation. And with that, the professional tools of trade are presence and curiosity. So I'm gonna come back to this idea of, these ideas of presence and curiosity and what they bring to this endeavour of um, conflict transformation as conflict transformation is integrated with learning and with the arts more broadly. Um, but I want to touch on, um, and again, I'm coming from an educational perspective here, and I realise that many of you will be coming from very different perspectives. And when I say education, I mean both school and beyond school. So some, you know, this is an education for me, this process. Our learning exchanges um, with impact are an educational process. Uh, I wake up in the morning and I feel like it's an educational process. Um, <laughs> purpose in my day um, to engage and relate with others. So I'm using education in a broader context here and really value the ways in which artists um, enable a melding of life and professional practice together to really be learners, lifelong learners and, and educationalists. And I'm really, um, I'm, I get really inspired by the work of Yert Biesta, B-I-E-S-T-A. Some of you may have come across his work. He's an educational philosopher. And he talks very much in, um, in a way that resonates so strongly with Carmen's words here. And he talks about the task of the educator as being one who supports a learner's shift from feeling like they're the centre of the world to being one within a wider world. He uses the term grown upness in this context, in a developmental sense of the term of grown upness, because he acknowledges that the um, translation into English is, is not a, a, a good one for this word. But he talks about this idea of grown upness. How do we support people around us to shift from um, a, a belief and a practice of being at the centre of the world to being part of the world. And this is where the intersection of the arts, conflict transformation really comes to um, uh, fruition for me as a, as a practitioner, as a teacher um, and as a researcher in that um, the arts can hold the paradoxes of us wanting to engage with the past injustices at the same time as trying to find a common ground to talk about future aspirations for peace. And it's a constant tension in the ways in which we encounter um, conflict, both at a global level in terms of sustainability, and also on a local level in terms of a school, um, a school playground, or in terms of a community engagement um, strategy or a community engagement process where cultures are in conflict, where beliefs are in conflict. Conflict, as Carmen said, is part of our um, everyday existence. And, and for those of us living in um, countries which, um, and I'll put it in inverted commas, are democratic or have a democratic presence at the centre of its belief systems or political governance, um, conflict, we need to understand and know how to manage conflict in those processes because conflict is the heart of democracy in some way. So how do we channel that? How do we work with that? So if we come back to these ideas of paradox, presence and curiosity, 
in the educational context, we can think of the arts in three different ways. And I acknowledge many researchers before me and writers before me who have, um, who have walked this path. There's the arts as a discipline. So what are the kind of disciplinary deep knowledges that we have about our arts practices? And they're deep knowledges around skill, around um, um, traditional forms of practice that are culturally inscribed, that have been developed over many years to become kind of virtuosic in whatever that context might be. And that might be from playing Beethoven to um, sharing a cultural dance um, in, the cent in Central Australia, a dance that's been danced for, for generations upon generations. So there's this concept of disciplinarity. There's also the context of the arts as play. So in what ways um, do we understand play learning as being the ultimate basis of what we do as artists in terms of taking uh, creativity, taking open-ended exploration to our encounters with the arts as a, as a mode of uh, being. There's also the arts as inquiry, which is a very prevalent approach in the education, the formal education system. So how do we engage with the tools, the aesthetic tools of the arts to inquire about what it means to be in relation with another person, what it means to um, to be a um, to be a citizen of a of a, a community or a nation? What does it mean to use the arts as inquiry in discipline areas like maths or English? If you're talking about the formal system, but arts is also a way of knowing. And this is what we can bring as artists into the space of education and of conflict transformation. And when we think of the arts as a way of knowing, it's not then just about the arts as um, a, a vehicle for learning about conflict or learning about peace, but arts as the enactment of peace and the enactment of transformation in conflict settings. And this is where the experiential dimension of holding space, of utilising aesthetic forms to engage with paradox and tension in ways that are conducive to change, that offer people opportunities to um, sit well and uncomfortable at the same time with the kinds of disturbing, distressing, challenging and uncomfortable learnings that we all um, experience when we encounter difference, when we encounter ourselves and others in that process, that transformation from being the centre of the world to being one of a wider, um, larger part of the world. So I think I'll leave that there as a, as a, um, as a contribution um, and a provocation and a resonance, and I'll pass over to Cindy. Okay, thanks, Marianne, um, and thank you, Carmen, too. So um, when we began to plan for this, I um, was reminded of conceptual work that I did a couple of decades ago when I was writing my dissertation and it seems to be like very resonant here and I'm going to try to share a couple of thoughts from that that are really for me for the most part kind of like a bedrock of what I'm doing um, but I hope that lifting them up and thinking about them conceptually maybe will be useful. It's been fun for me to, to do this. Um, so I I've been thinking about trying to understand at sort of the deep conceptual levels, what are the real links among education, conflict transformation, and aesthetic engagement? And certainly the ideas that Carmen and Marianne have expressed are, you'll hear them woven in here. Um, and my work focused on one specific aspect of peace building, namely reconciliation. So as I studied um, these concepts, and thought about them in relation to each other, I discovered a possible common denominator among these three concepts, each of which is enormously complex in itself. 
And it's about the nature of the transformation that they involve, or at least that they can be crafted to involve, not that they inevitably involve. But, um, and I'm gonna try to explore this in relation to each of these three areas, but it's a kind of transformation that respects the integrity of the one who is being transformed, or more precisely, transformation that respects the integrity of people who are transformed and communities for that matter who are transforming themselves so this requires a little bit of thinking about well what do we really mean by integrity <laughs> another complex concept with a lot of definitions but for many people integrity has this sense of an unchanging steadfast commitment to a set of values um, an alignment of actions and beliefs and if uh, in the 90s, I think, there were several feminist philosophers who were committed to living lives of integrity and, and supporting that in their students, but also committed to radical transformation, as the feminist project is. Um, so how do, we, how do we think about integrity when we're thinking also about transformation in this uh, very serious way? So... Uh, what um, two particular feminist philosophers came up with, Mar Maria Lugones, who's Argentinian, by the way, Carmen, and Victoria Davian, um, argue that it's, it's possible to maintain a sense of integrity while we're changing radically when we monitor our own processes of change and we ensure that the various dimensions of ourselves or our various selves do not undermine each other. Um, uh, another philosoph feminist philosopher, Cheshire Calhoun, adds that we that to live and be in community with integrity, we th that human communities benefit when individuals are willing to take a stand and to hold on to those stands, those positions, even when they're unpopular, but also let go of them when we become convinced that another view is better. So. These are, it's this kind of idea of integrity that I'm invoking here when I say that education and peace building and the arts are all supporting transformation with integrity. So for education, I'm sort of beginning with this basic idea um, that education isn't just about getting people to believe certain things, but to understand and assess the evidence that leads to their beliefs. And um, that's, a, if we think about the difference between education and indoctrination, or the difference between education and socialization, we can see that um, it's that ability to monitor, to, to have integrity with what we believe means to become metacognitively aware of what we think and why, and to be willing to ongoingly assess the evidence by which we come to our beliefs. Um, and I'll, I'll mention two other sort of conceptions of education, one from Nell Noddings and with her focus on caring, that education requires that learners be instructed to use their knowledge in the service of caring. And I would say the cultivation of the necessary capacities to care, such as empathy and compassion. And a third view taken from the well-known philosopher Martin Buber, that is the importance of understanding that a learner is not just an individual. A learner is embedded in a community, and a learner's ways of knowing and being are intersubjectively linked to that group. So, and this becomes especially important when we think about peace building, to understand that while we are intersubjectively linked, so in thinking in ethical and epistemological terms, we're, we're strongly linked in terms of what we know and what we value with our own communities. We're also linked in a different web of ethical and epistemological relationship with the other, which I kind of describe as trans-subjectivity. So we can't really understand the meaning of our own people's narratives until we understand the ethical significance of our own group actions on the stories of the other. So anyway, I feel within this, we can find some um, 
some recognition of this idea that education supports us and it supports a kind of transformation for people of all ages, but with integrity, with a sense of um, understanding what is the transformation we're going through and what is its implications for ourselves. So switching gears to peace building, um, maybe it would be helpful to think about this in relation to the difference between the kinds of changes that are wrought during war and the kinds of changes that are cultivated in processes of peace building. I mean, acts of violence change lives and they destroy buildings and change the nature of communities, but with little regard for the well being or the integrity of the other. They transform through destruction. Peace is also, peace also seeks transformations, um, changes in consciousness and relationships and attitudes and behaviors. And of, of course, there are many dimensions of building peace. But I believe that peace builders pursue, pursue transformation, keeping in mind and aiming towards the strengthening of individuals and communities and the strengthening of the capacities for integrity within individuals and communities because in order to reconcile, in order to build relationships of cross difference, people must be able to know what they believe, to be able to question what they believe, to speak empathically and sincerely, and especially when it comes to reconciliation, when they're working to rebuild trust. Um, so I would say that in general, peace building and also reconciliation in particular require the kinds of transformation that education cultivates, namely metacognitive awareness of one's own meaning making, capacities for and commitments to empathy, presence and compassion, and the ability to negotiate the complexities of both valuing one's own community and the skills to compassionately interrogate its assumptions about itself. So I'm coming into the end here. I hope I haven't gone over my time too much. <laughs> but um, so why are the arts and aesthetic engagement well suited to the educational tasks and challenges of peace building and reconciliation? What, what makes the, why do we believe the arts are, and especially aesthetic engagement are so well suited to the challenges that we're facing? And there's probably hundreds of answers to this question. Um, but when we think about the nature of aesthetic experience itself, the kind of pleasure that we feel when there's a resonance between how we perceive and witness the formal qualities of a work and the formal qualities of the work, in other words, our perceptual capacities and then what's built into the work, this resonance arises when there's a kind of reciprocity um, between the artwork and the viewer slash creator, which maybe can be understood when we compare it with analysis where the knower imposes preconceived ideas onto the work and propaganda where the work imposes meanings that are embedded into it onto the knower or attempts to do that. But I think that art, when it works as art, it issues an invitation to its witnesses to consider new meanings, to experience new feelings, to imagine and interpret free from preconceived categories, and therefore to become meaning makers. I think art speaks to us and draws us out as people with integrity. And of course, when art is working as art, the process is, it issues an invitation to artists to express themselves with originality, with agency and complexity, and to create works that reach beneath the defenses of others, and in, through their beauty, invite them to attend to pay attention, to be present. Um, so in these ways, I see education, the arts and peace building as very strongly aligned um, at the deepest conceptual level, ethically and conceptually. And I think it's why artists, teaching artists um, have such an important role to play as peace builders, because you're right there at the nexus of these three, um, three, three complex bodies of theory and practice. So I'll stop there.
Thank you, Cindy and uh, Madeleine. Now we pass it to you. If people have questions, and you can organize that this part of the of the of the conversation. Sure. So I think at this stage, the idea was to sort of have a little reflection, have an opportunity to ask questions or delve deeper into any of the things that have been said in this last section before we then move on to the next section. So you can all take the opportunity to unmute microphones and say what you say what you're thinking. You can also utilize the little messaging system. Um, and so to begin with, I think what's usually helpful is just to propose the question, are there any questions? And then if there aren't, what has sprung to mind, what's particularly resonated with you about what you've heard? And you can either offer those up vocally or in the messaging system. I have a question for Cynthia. Yeah. Uh, Cynthia, could you expand more on this? It seems like you said something along the lines that peace builds power and integrity. Uh, can you expand on some of that or whether I got that correctly or not? Um, what I was saying is that to build peace requires people to have integrity and communities to have integrity in the sense that they have to have a capacity for, um, for being able to articulate what they believe, to question what they believe, to, you know, and to expand their beliefs in relation to the other. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the challenging part is that, so I'm thinking now particularly of, of reconciliation. So in the aftermath of violence, um, when we're lucky, we can work towards reconciliation. Um, this requires um, people to be able, people and communities to be able to, to build trust where, where trust where there is no warrant for trust. Mm. How do we transform relationships from, you know, the willingness to injure the other to meet your needs to a, a, a trust in, in the respect and well-being and collaboration for a joint future. <clears throat> and um, this, these are the very capacities that are injured and eclipsed by violence. So I think one of the most important roles that the arts can play and educational processes of many kind is helping people experience taking risks even when they don't have an, a sense of trust mm -hmm. and start to build trust slowly over time mm -hmm. to become aware, to monitor their process of building trust. Um, so that's maybe one, one way uh, in which I think peace building, so as peace builders, as educators, we have to, in most cases in the aftermath of violence, we have to build people's capacity to operate with integrity and to begin to cultivate, even to be able to discern when trust is warranted and when it isn't so that you can open yourself to learning from the other. Mm -hmm. Artists can play the role of listeners when people's capacity to listen has been impaired. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question to you, Cynthia, too. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Promil, and um, I, I was just wondering, uh, if your study has centered around any any um, specific uh, communities that have gone through conflict or um, um, uh, as a case study or something like that because i've been working for a long time uh, with uh, uh, artists artisans artisanal communities um, in the northernmost state of India, um, which comprises of three districts, and Kashmir is one of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, and um, they have traditionally, uh, and still continue to do so, um, create, um, 
create um, uh, tangible cultural artifacts that have been valued over centuries. So beginning with the Kashmir shawl, which was then replicated in Scotland, and then uh, moving on to hand knotted carpets. In fact, they have 34 registered craft practices. Mm. And each of those craft practices are exquisite. So um, notwithstanding the the political turmoil and conflict that has been ongoing in the region, the um, communities continue to create. And I quite, uh, I quite agree with you when you say that um, um, art and art practices, they enable, uh, enable creation of peace and uh, more so because uh, they, they work um, together, they don't work in isolation, right? So, I mean, the whole idea of a community of artisans working together primarily stems from the fact that each one uh, executes a specific um, um, process or a specific skill. And uh, collectively, they're able to create these wonderful um, commodities. So I was just wondering if, uh, I mean, like a lot of what you, the three of y'all have shared resonates with what I've been working with and what I've been experiencing over the years. And uh, I was just curious to know whether, uh, like, uh, so if I'm able to, if I'm able to situate my work in Kashmir, I was just wondering if, uh, I mean, just to sort of give a face or a geographical identity to, to a region that you may have been working with. Um, just for me to understand how uh, you all have been addressing um, any issues that may have come up and how best to, uh, to sort of uh, resolve them or to sort of um, answer questions that may be posed, uh, primarily coming from there. Well, um, I'll, I can answer this. We were going to spend some time discussing cases, but uh, I'll, when I'm done, maybe um, both Marianne and Carmen have something you want to say about particular cases. My own, I developed these theoretical frames because of a project that I was working on with Jewish and Palestinian women living right. here in the Boston area. And seeing if we could find, create spaces for conversation by emphasizing folk arts, embroidery and paper cutting and family photographs and recipes and remedies that were some ways different and some ways similar. But, um, and the project uh, lasted for several years and um, the Intifada in the late 80s grew up in the middle of it. And, um, and it was kind of shattering, but it propelled me into these questions, like what makes me think that the arts and aesthetics work? You know, so that's mm. one basic community mm. um, that I've worked in. And I've since worked with other people, especially young people from the Middle East. Um, right. Yeah. So mostly, uh, mostly concentrated in the Boston area, right? So these were, these were people who had relocated from their uh, original geographical settings to that a was, new... That, that, was that, they yeah. that was that particular project. Right, right. Um, Marianne and I were involved in a very large project called Acting Together on the World Stage, mm -hmm. in which the performance artists, theater people, and ritual leaders from 14 different regions of the world described their practice. And one was a very, um, a, a kind of, traditional, I mean, play in the sense that it wasn't like playback theater or theater of the oppressed, but a, a play, a scripted play in which Hindu actors presented the story of the Muslim minority uh, in Gujarat. And, you know, the experience of that and of the, the way in which that play crossed some of those divisions and allowed this primarily Hindu audience to empathize with the suffering of the, the, um, the Muslim community was very powerful and very beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, and I, I would just say one other thing about this sort of description that you have of these registered crafts, I'm thinking about an initiative that was undertaken by people who are expatriates from Aleppo in Syria. 
and thinking about how the rebuilding of that city maybe could place, have something about um, rebuilding trust among the different factions that have, have been forced to flee. And what they all had in common was um, music, food, and craft, and the, you know, the market. And so maybe in the planning process for the new city, those commonalities, those common interests could be built on to begin to rebuild some relationships of trust. Mm -hmm. So I also, we have one question in the comment section and then I think we'll move on um, to the next section. But we have a question here, um, verbal violence, emotional violence. How do we hold these in this conversation? Hi. Oh, hi. Anna. Do you hear Madeleine? Oh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get used to this Zoom thing, which is new for me today. So <laughs> I can wait my turn for, for one comment. Go ahead, I think. Okay. Well, first, uh, I'm Ines Sanguinetti from Crear Vale la Pena Argentina. And I want to thank you so much for the three beautiful women, so smart, so moving, everything you said. And um, I want, I remain with something Marianne said that I think it's, it's the core thing of how to move on. Marianne said art as an enactment of peace instead of helping peace. And I thought, what would happen as a, as, as a special force to move forward with this concept of, instead of helping peace, helping education, helping the prevention of violence, helping health, what would it be our uh, strength if we could concentrate in the future as art as an enactment, because I, I was thinking if Seoul Agenda in 20, uh, 2010 already said, I think there were like 150 countries got getting together for arts education, and, and the, the conclusion was arts education can make a direct contribution to resolving the social and cultural challenges facing the world today. So. That is it. It's already said, I mean, in a global level. And I think that we are still uh, trying to prove the point. But when Marianne said this, I said, wow. No? Hmm. I, or uh, arts in schools, in communities, but for helping something instead of perhaps concentrating in the reality art can put in, in the in present life. Because when we do that, the transformation is there and the capacity to integrity and to is there. But I don't know why we continue to go in proving points and explaining ourselves. Mm. Mm. So that reflection on um, it. Inez, I'm, I'm glad, I, I'm very happy to hear that that resonated. And I guess it's a good segue into some of the case studies. So we wanted to share a couple of um, examples of practice to just lead into the second half of the conversation here. So. Maybe I'll just touch base with that um, with that comment um, amplified a little bit more through an example here in Australia, um, and um, to also um, it, partly address the comment there from Carol around verbal violence and emotional violence. So I work in the Australian context where. Um, in my particular context, working with deep structural violence um, regarding the, the fact that um, the invasion uh, in Australia over 200 years ago, uh, reconciliation processes have been um, 
uh, have been thwarted, have not worked, um, are um, continuing to have that, that conflict, that very violent conflict um, in the 1800s in Australia um, with English um, uh, settlement in Australia and interaction with local communities is, um, is resulting in deep structural violence in our country. And, um, and I'm going to just bring up an example of a teaching artist, Ruth Langford, who, um, Victoria, who's also on the, um, <laughs> Victoria, joining me from Tasmania. Um, Ruth Langford is, a, um, is an Aboriginal woman who partners um, with me in the teaching of a, a unit in arts education. So she partners in terms of comes in uh, for a workshop where in our Australian curriculum, there's a, um, there's a requirement for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives to be engaged with in the curriculum. And Inez, that's an example for me of an approach which is um, thinking about peace or integrating the arts as a teaching about peace. And many people have interpreted this about, okay, we would come, an artist might come into a school and say and teach about the yadaki or the, the didgeridoo, teach about the instruments of Aboriginal expression. Um, they might teach about cave paintings or expressing cultural knowledge and respect around that, um, or engage in play type learning in terms of uh, dance and embodied movement. All of those are great. All of those are important and all of those are absolutely vital for the growing awareness of the cultural practices that are really at the heart and the centre of um, the Indigenous cultures that, that live on this land, who lived on this land for many, many generations. But they are only part of the, part of the uh, process in terms of that's a, a kind of learning about the culture and almost objectifying a culture through a, a structural organisation like the curriculum. What Ruth does with our students is walk with them. So um, she comes in and to just give you a really grounded example, um, when she talks about ancestry, she might be talking about generations that are, you know, hundreds of generations. And she invites the students, both um, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal, from many different cultures in our classes, um, to think about who, who is on their shoulder, who, who's on the right-hand shoulder, who are, who, are the women, who are the women mothers and grandmothers to whom um, they walk with in their everyday life, who are the male, the father, the grandfather, um, the generation, who are they on their shoulder that walk with? And it, it translates this idea of learning about a culture into walking with a way of knowing. Um, and she, she brings in a rock, or she, she brought in a rock, this is the example of last year, and, um, and, and um, with respect to Ruth, I haven't told her that I was going to share this today because it's just a great example, though. So I'm hoping, um, I'm speaking from a white uh, woman experiencing this as a walking with. She brought in a rock as an example of a life form, um, when we think of a rock as being something very static, um, something that has hard edges, that is hard and that you hold. And throughout the session, she, she had introduced the rock and just, gave, just, just let the rock kind of be in the space with us. So people would hold the rock and, as we did some other activities um, until we, we came to the end of the session to realise that the rock is still living and that it's many generations old, but we had all held the rock. And that the embodiment of the human and the, and the material of the rock were actually shared. That there was, there was a boundary with the life force of the rock. Um, and again, this was about an epistemology, a way of knowing life as distinct and, a, and an engagement to be with um, and an invitation to walk with which for us is a deep peace building practice in Australia, um, rather than a teaching about peace, about the ways in which, you know, we need to raise awareness about, uh, you know, aspects of, uh, of cultural understandings. So that's, a, that's a, a very quick example. I'm very happy to explain more of what we did in a more conventional arts based way with you, but um, that's just a, a, a case example to, um, to potentially shift back now to Carmen or others uh, or in Cindy, if there were other examples that we were thinking about sharing. Yeah, I would like to, I'm sorry, Cindy. Go. 
Uh, uh, yes, I would like to, to share a, a case also uh, that um, it's a, from Crear by La Pena <laughs> and um, it's a project that uh, some years ago that took five months and it ended up with a play created and performed by 40 young artists from seven different countries. And all of them were members of NGOs that were focused on art and social transformation. And these artists have never been together before. So they had to meet each other, to understand each other and learn how to work together. And they started the work by using a virtual network, emails, blogs, and for four months, they thought together about coexistence and social and cultural diversity. And this topic was essential for them because many were immigrants or marginalized members of their own societies and communities. So among them, they spoke seven different languages. They didn't even have English as a common language. So for five months, everything had to be translated into four languages. Mm. And at the first stages, they were drawing because that was a very important way of communication. And after the virtual connection, they spent a month together in Germany where they created an, uh, a play where they put together what they have been thinking and sharing. And this play was presented later in public theaters in Germany and uh, Slovakia. No? And the name of the project was Respect. Mm -hmm. And the aim, the, the, the aim that they had was to apply critical thinking and then to use artistic language present their personal and their collective experiences on the topic of being excluded from society. And they started with the, with the hypothesis that tolerance, a word that everybody uses, were more an attitude of looking away or, and of accepting differences as long as they were not imposed onto us. And they wanted to talk about respect, because they understood that Respect is the conscious look onto others with openness for dialogue and acknowledging that differences are good. And the whole project was designed as a joint exploration with open results. They didn't want to try to agree in, on anything or to ex explain to the audience anything. They just wanted to challenge audiences with the stereotypes related with differences and qualities. But I have to say that two of the adults that were working with them are here with us today, Ines Sanguinetti and Georg Engeli. But I just wanted to share, because I think it's, 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 it's uh, something that talks what we were just analyzing, that when they finished the play, they decided to do something special. They stood in front of, of, of sat in front of, of the audience and they, then one artist said in a neutral voice, have you ever felt excluded for your personal opinion? If the answer is yes, please stand up. And some actors did at the beginning. Then she asked, have you ever been ridiculed for your physical appearance? And some actors and somebody from the audience stood up. And have you ever been hurt by comments about your beliefs? Have you been joked about your gender? Have anybody made fun of you because of the way you're speaking. They, they put one question after the other questions that they have been victims of. And people were, were standing and standing and at the end, almost everybody in the theater were standing up. And there was a silence and there was a lot of people crying. And then the artist said, respect, and lights went off and that was the end. And I think that, that puts a lot of, of things together of what we were considering and, 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 and questioning about how art plays mm. this, no? Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I quickly add one example? Uh, yes. Um, I, 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 wanted, I feel that this question about verbal and emotional violence is really important. Um, and I understand it in this way, that I think that violence is an act that impairs the agency of, of the other, of another person or another community. So whether that's done through murder, through injury, through uh, speech, um, 
that's all ways of impairing the other's capacity to act in the world, to manifest their projects and to do. And so, yeah, I think verbal and emotional violence are very brought up in here. And it may, made me think about this project I was part of years ago when we were working with young Haitian children in the Cambridge Public Schools. These were kids who, you know, were refugees here and some of them had come from villages where they had never seen a clock or a watch or a toilet, got on a plane, landed in the middle of an American city, Cambridge, and were ad adapting to life here. And in their school, they were just the absolute bottom of the social hierarchy. I mean, they didn't speak English well, they smelled, they were said to be carrying AIDS. And in the course of having storytellers work with them and having them draw images of their, the home that they remembered, these images and the stories that they told about them became the bridge where at first other teachers and then even other students like heard their stories and began to look at them in a new way. And just to go briefly, I mean, by the end of the project, they had decided to take these images and put them onto note cards, again with the help of an artist, and sell them to raise money for an eye clinic in Haiti. So I, you know, this is like a really like selling note cards, uh, whatever, but what it was, was, was the chance for them to um, manifest their own feelings and concerns and take care of their own community when it was being really it's so fragile. And I, I saw it as a, a beautiful example of, of young people um, gaining the capacity to take agency in relation to themselves and their community through an art making project. Um, so, that's an example too. And I'm sure that people here have many others and time is short, but maybe we, I don't know, um, Madeline, should we hear a couple of other examples? Yeah, so we have about five minutes until the end of the session. So if anyone wants to quickly contribute some stories about some of the work that they've done and just share that so we can get a feel for what experience and what projects have happened from people on the call, um, briefly, that would be very welcome. Hello. Can I? Oh. Who's going first? Victoria, you're up. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, everybody. It's it's just been fascinating. It it felt like what I needed this morning to get my mind back into the right kind of gear. Um, I'm very interested by uh, the point that Cynthia made about um, how we reach beneath the defences of others, particularly in the times we live in at the moment. And I suppose my work has always been about acknowledging the power of children, particularly young children, when you take them out of context that we're used to seeing them in. And so my work around publishing books that are by children, for children, with children, um, I, I, I've always found it fascinating that when children present their ideas on a topic that normally is dealt with by adults or in a way that's surprisingly presented and of course this can be in any art form um, how it can go under the defenses of, of the audience and allow adults to, to, to really understand things in a different way and I think as teaching artists that's a very important part of our work is, is to bring those voices of children and young people um, out of the spaces where they're normally contained. Um, I'll put up a link to Kids Own Publishing because I think there's some lovely examples in that canon of work. So for instance, under fives, um, uh, uh, talking about um, gender violence from an under fives perspective is just a really lovely, very different way of, of, of thinking about it. Um, and yes, there've been some lovely projects over the years, which I think resonate with today's discussion. Thank you. Before we start to wrap up, is there anyone else who would quickly like to share a project or a piece of work they've been involved in that relates to the theme? Okay, so in that case, I think we will start to wrap up. 
Um, before we do, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone for tuning in and participating. Um, do have a look at the comment section before you sign off. Um, some people have posted links throughout, um, which I don't want to interrupt the conversation to point out, but they are there. Um, you can go and see some examples of conflict transformation projects that have happened um, that people didn't want to necessarily voice, but they're there. Also, um, as I was saying before, thank you so much for logging on. I know some of you have come to us from various newsletters and aren't necessarily tuned into the ITAC Collaborative. For those of you who don't know, very briefly, what ITAC is, it's the International Teaching Artists Collaborative. And as Carmen said, the ITAC vision is a world where every country has artists working in the heart of communities and learning. Where these artists are continually improving, internationally connected and well supported, and the potential of the practice and its transformative power is visible and valued. At the moment, um, we have 500 people on that we consider members, that's on our mailing list from around 40 countries. Um, and all of these people are working in the participatory arts and in arts for social justice and arts for social change. So it's a it's the sort of first international collaborative network of people who do what we do in the participatory arts. So if you aren't signed up to that mailing list, do remember to sign up, do email me afterwards and ask, you can do it on our website. Um, and we publish regularly information about think tanks. We have one a month hosted on a different topic by different people in different countries each time. And um, it's just a great way to connect with people who are doing the similar kind of work in different countries and we would never otherwise meet. So I'm really thankful that we're all here. We've fluctuated between around 30 and 40 people today, which is great. Um, so I would love to keep the conversation going. Normally what I do is start an email chain with everyone. Um, you can opt out if that's not your thing, that's fair enough. But just email me afterwards if you're not into it and I will not involve you. Similarly, I've recorded this session audio only and I will post that as an archived conversation so that colleagues who couldn't be here today can listen back afterwards. If you have an issue and you don't want your voice used, anything like that, again, email me afterwards. Usually it's up within about 48 hours of the session ending. So with that being said, I just want to again remind you to look at the comments. There are links coming up all the time. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much to our three hosts. I think you'll all agree that um, it's been fascinating listening. I've jotted down a few phrases. You probably saw me typing as you were talking. That I'm going to go away and do some, some looking into. So with that being said, I sort of hate to end this call because I'm really enjoying it, but I think we have to come to a close. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to our hosts. And I would encourage you, all of you, to sign up to our future think tanks and join us each month for developed practice and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So thank you very much. Thanks to all okay. of you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.